So this is probably the dumbest review ever. Who wants to review six or seven DAX all in one video? You know, to the lay person, they probably all sound the same anyway. They're all high quality. Um, but to me and you, we know that they sound different. So let's go through the differences. But to my right here, let's start off. This is the Denifrips Aries 2, followed by the Bifrost 2 on top, the Gungnir on the bottom, also called the Gumby. This is the RME ADI 2 DAC. Beneath it is the Topping D90. Over here is the Expensive Crew. We got the Cord Cutest on top, followed by the Hugo Tabletop 2, then the M Scaler on the bottom. You see, if I was smart, I'd separate all these out into different videos and get some sweet ad revenue. But I'm not smart. I don't give a about the ad money or logic. Uh, I just want the truth. And honestly, it's hard enough to find one of these in any kind of audio store and demo them in a quiet room, much less AB compare with the other models here. And it's always great to read reviews of, wow, this sounds amazing. Uh, I love this aspect of this deck. But I also want to just compare it to other things in its range, uh, just to see uh, what else I would like or dislike based on the competition. So let's talk about the contenders. Let's start over here. These are R2R ladder decks, uh, meaning they use a series of resistors lined in parallel, uh, which resembles a, sort of a ladder design. The Aries being the more old school setup of the two with a discrete circuit, while the other two are multi-bit decks. They use chips with a smaller resistor pattern embedded inside the chip. The topping and the RME use the most popular DAC technology, off-the-shelf Delta Sigma chips manufactured by someone else. These DACs are generally easier to build and less expensive to manufacture. Um, you'll see a wide variety of converters, both cheap and high-end, that use this technology. The Cord DACs also decode digital audio using Delta Sigma modulation, um, but they use a custom FPGA chip. It's called a Field Programmable Gate Array. So instead of using a pre-designed chip from AKM or ESS, for example, uh, they buy a customizable chip and program it to their exact specifications. It's more legwork on their end, and you do pay a premium for it. Test setup is in the description. Uh, I did use an XLR switcher, which I'll also link there, um, just for quick A-B comparison sake. Uh, and you'll be happy to know that Amir himself said there's very little to no signal degradation when using the, this particular X XLR switcher. So there's that. So let's get this party started and join me on my madness listening to these for months at a time and seeing what's what. So first I'm going to start with a DAC that I'm definitely 100% keeping and that is the Denifrips Aries 2. Denifrips Aries 2 一个完全采用RAR梯形电路的数字模拟转换器该款产品的设计和制造由中国完成在新加坡设有销售渠道 并通过国际经销商销往世界各地，它拥有绝佳的做工和一流的音质效果，使Dynaribs家族最便宜的转换器，仅需大约750美元，您就可以拥有它。I uh, am continually wowed by how rich and enveloping the sound is. Honestly, it's it's just the one that I have to keep, uh, with one caveat, uh, which I'll talk about in a bit. The organic sound sort of feels like I'm hooked to a tube amp. Uh, but you still get that same euphonic sound uh, coming out of solid state amps as well using this. And when I switch back and forth between this and Delta Sigma DACs, there's an instant difference and increase in intimacy with the vocals here on the Aries too. Take your favorite rock or folk rock tracks uh, and it feels like the lead singer is like singing in the room to you versus just sitting at a recording studio. I wasn't getting that with the topping with the RME and not even the cord could match the level of intimacy that this provided. I have to point out that with the Aries, you do miss out on those micro details, uh, most notably on the upper, uh, upper frequency range, but you tend not to mind at all. Uh, the enveloping nature of the sound here is it really seduces you and it just has this way of drawing you in and just keeping you engaged. Uh, comparing directly to multi-bit multi DACs like the Bifrost 2 here, um, you get that same sense of richness, uh, but the Aries really has the edge on enhancing mids with this creamy-like smoothness. That said, where the Denifrips wins out on richness, the multi-bit DACs balance out that characteristic with better micro details across the spectrum. And this is where the caveat I mentioned earlier comes into play. The big downside of the Aries is if you're listening to genres where full range dynamics and precision may be preferred, like pop or electronic um, or other songs that you're into, 
you'd be better served by any of the other DACs in this roundup. Well, with all of that glorious organic and liquid smoothness uh, comes a slight price. Um, so there are two reasons why I'm keeping this DAC. It's amazing sound signature and it's uh, insane value for the price. Uh, so I'm actually going to keep another one of these uh, DAC units um, for when precision and dynamics are preferred. And that's right, I hate myself and I'll be going through the trouble of switching between multiple DACs instead of listening to just one. Uh, but if you listen on, you'll see why it's hard to stick with just a single unit here. So let's quickly discuss the features. Um, there's an oversampling toggle that switches between non-oversampling and one times oversampling mode. Uh, try yourself to see what you like. I would go back and forth myself, depending on the song. In one times oversample mode, it sounds a bit more detailed and more refined, but in NOS, non-oversampling mode, you get that sound that leans more on the smoother side uh, without any harshness or any glare at all. Uh, I like both, but for most of this review, I kept it on one times oversampling mode. Otherwise, the other DACs would just absolutely kill it in the details department. So there's also a slow and sharp filter toggle. Um, for Delta Sigma DACs, I'd normally set the filter uh, for my personal listening habits. I, I usually set it on slow for Delta Sigma, so things can sound a little bit more natural. Slow on the Aries to me is just too slow. Uh, the sound signature of this R2R unit is already smooth and relaxed, and adding another slow filter to the mix, it, it kind of puts this on relaxed overkill. I prefer the organic sound of the Aries 2 with the sharp filter mode selected, which is the default setting. So let's get to the pros and cons of the Aries 2. Um, we'll start off with the advantages, uh, but it has that smooth and engaging and harmonically rich sound signature. It has a wide and lifelike sound stage. Uh, the price. There have been other R2 RDACs that have been cheaper, such as the Drop Arist, but the Aries is really a breakthrough R2 RDAC that just, it oozes quality and punches way above its price point. I mean, it's not just me. Other reviewers are saying the same thing. For $650, it's, it's a ton of value. I mean, for this level of sound, you'd expect to pay over $1,000. Easy. So on to the disadvantages. Um, it's not as detailed, I mentioned before, on the top end as the competition. It does have an unintuitive filter selection since they kind of repurpose all the, the front panel LEDs to do different functions. I constantly have to look at the manual to verify which light does what when I hit the mute button. It puts it in like toggle mode, but it's still very confusing. And also the last thing I'll mention, there is a wait time on order. So let's move on to the topping D90 here. D90 is the best of the whole company. The best of the design and the best of the design. This is the best of the design. It's still made in China and made. The price of the MQA is 700 yuan. This one retails at $700 USD, or it starts at, because there's an MQA version, which is $100 more, but this is the non-MQA. And from what I've been reading, this is currently the most sought after DAC in the sub $1,000 price range. Uh, it measures amazingly well, even better than the ADI-2, and it's almost half the price of the RME, which is pretty spectacular. It has two AK4499 chips inside, the latest and greatest from AKM in Japan, uh, and for this new generation of chip, they revamped the design to focus on reducing distortion and noise. This coupled with Topping's history of making quality DACs um, for the price, and you really get a great recipe here. So as far as the sound, I instantly notice a heavy focus on detail when comparing to the R2R DACs, as you can imagine. The sound may not feel as organic as the R2Rs, uh, but it's very speedy. It feels more exact, uh, more precise. The Decay feels like your typical Delta Sigma DAC, uh, straight to the point. It doesn't linger around and give you that sense of euphonic engagement, um, but instead creates a more visceral and energetic signature, uh, where the previous note kind of quickly dissolves to, the, to make way for the next one. And to me, the, the sum of all this creates this sense of superior clarity and separation. I absolutely love listening to electronic music on the D90. Uh, paired with the V280 and the Aria, it's just so pleasing to listen to synthesizers, uh, bass extensions, razor sharp percussive elements. Um, it, it's all very dynamic, it's all very, very fast. And, and I've listened to other Delta Sigma DACs in this price range and, and lower. And let me tell you why this one gets such high praises. It has the hallmark qualities of being super clean and really transparent 
while not sounding overly harsh or fatiguing. The constant battle with DACs and Delta Sigma models in particular is creating a balance of accuracy and detail while not assaulting the listener's ears with all of that information. You can quickly get listening fatigue when things get overly metallic or grating, you know, I call it glare, uh, when a cymbal hits or there are other high frequency dynamics. This is something cheaper Delta Sigma DACs typically struggle with. The D90, however, has an insane level of resolution, separation, and purity while not sporting an abundance of harshness. This to me shows its degree of refinement and will make it worth the price of admission for those who want the, the best in detail, the best in transparency under $1,000. That said, it's not the perfect DAC. It has the smallest sound stage of the bunch. I'm just gonna put that out now. Um, with the D90, it feels as though everything is, is front and center with all of the micro details delivered on a silver platter versus being in a big concert hall just surrounded by all the instruments. If you want that big open sound stage, check out the others in this roundup. Um, some people will really prefer that, but to me, this honestly just sounds so good, I wouldn't let that prevent me from buying one if I was looking at options in this price range. So switching to the downsides about the features here, you have your basic sharp and slow filters uh, and more, uh, but you can only toggle through them with the remote. Same with the volume when you're in preamp mode and most other functions, you just have to use the remote. I just wish Topping would put all the buttons and toggles on the front panel for easier control, especially for headphone users. You know, not all of us have the nice fancy two-channel systems, but you know, that's just a minor gripe overall. Uh, also, to get into preamp mode where you can control the volume on this, it, it's literally like a puzzle. I felt like I read the manual five times and it honestly took me some Googling to find out that I had to cut the power switch on the back of the unit hold the power button on the front while switching back on the, the power from the back, and uh, you get into this alternate settings menu. Um, who, who decided, decided that? that? Another quibble I'll mention, although I appreciate the digital display, it does look a bit cheap, especially compared to the ADI-2, which is getting on in years. On the Topping D90, it's just a low resolution display, and the layout and placement of the information presented isn't the most eye-catching. It feels like it's just kind of like thrown all over. Uh, most of you probably won't care, especially if it sits away from you in an uh, equipment rack. But since I had the RME here to compare, I just had to bring it up. And again, it's not a deal breaker by any means, but it's worth hoping that Topping will step up their game in a future model. And that's it for gripes. I just have no more issues with this. Uh, some relatively minor use user interface comments is not bad. Uh, I really like the D90's simplicity and just straight raw performance. It does exactly what a DAC is supposed to do, and it does it extremely well. So pros and cons, reference class sound for this price range. You honestly will not miss a thing. I'll also argue this is probably the most bang per buck, um, considering all the details this provides. Uh, and it has a great balance of details without being overly harsh. The disadvantages, lack of front panel control, and just a cheap looking LCD screen. All right. The Multi-bit DACs from Shite Audio. Shite Audio. I can't say that word because Google gets upset, affects the algorithm, don't want to chance it. Both the Bifrost 2 and the Gungnir feature multi-bit technology with a resistor to resistor setup, somewhat similar to the Ares 2. Nothing sounds quite like a good multi-bit implementation, and for the money, you'd be hard-pressed to find better performers. The Bifrost 2 retails for $700, and the Gungnir cost $1,300. Both DACs are designed and built in the United States. And the Bifrost 2 in particular, it's the newest model. These were actually sold out for months back in the spring and early summer 2020 due to supply chain issues. So I picked up the Gungnir first actually. It had Unison pre-installed and the Gungnir hardware-wise is a serious step up from the Bifrost. Um, and also it has a serial number starting with the letter B. So supposedly it's the latest revision, uh, but don't tell Jason Stoddard I said that or else I'll get pissed. I was lucky enough to get my hands on a Bifrost 2 a bit later, so why not throw both in the mix? So uh, both of these DACs use multi-bit technology. So what does it mean? In a nutshell, they are also a resistor to resistor ladder design, but the chips in these were originally designed for various other implementations such as medical and military devices where precision and reliability are key. 
And on to the tail of the tape. Jason Stoddard himself says Bifrost 2 uses 18-bit DAC, same as Gungnir. However, it only used two of them, not four, and they are of lesser spec. If you look at the model numbers. They both do eight times over sampling. The Bifrost 2 does this now. Uh, to get the sample rate of 352 kilohertz before decoding. First of all, before I get into the sound, I have to hand it to the company for going the extra mile and creating their own custom-made USB interface called Unison. Um, it's not just marketing, it, they are very proud of this new tech, and they should be, as it helps reduce artifacts. It puts audio signal purity first over simple device handshaking with your computer, like most normal USB interfaces. For me, it was literally plug and play into both Windows 10 and Mac OS. I didn't have to download drivers, and Room picked it up right away. As for the sound, I find both the Bifrost 2 and the Gumby to be a middle ground between the richness of the Ares 2 and the highly resolving details of the Delta Sigma DACs. I can truly see the appeal of owning one multi-pit DAC that does both sound signatures well versus owning one discrete R2R and one Delta Sigma. So when I'm listening to the Ares 2, there are times when I know I'm missing some details, uh, despite the euphonic sound that I'm getting. Uh, when I switch to either of the multi-bits here, I get the details back while still retaining a sizable degree of that euphonic sound from the Ares. It's not as smooth as the Ares, um, but I wouldn't expect it to be with the increase in clarity. So let's now compare the Bifrost 2 to the Topping D90, since they're in a similar price range and I feel people are kind of deciding between these two. Uh, the Bifrost by itself sounds very clean and detailed, but when you switch to the D90, you notice that the topping takes it a step further. Backgrounds are the blackest on the D90. It um, means it just gets super quiet when it's time to get quiet. Um, and separation and dynamics are really just a notch above. What you gain on the Bifrost is that, that sense of fullness, um, bigger body. And uh, these characteristics are what make multi-bit special. So in the end, it depends on your application. I could see the appeal of this a lot, and I can also see the appeal of this a lot. Um, you know, you have to try this though. I, I really recommend just trying it. It's it's different sound, and you, you get those details that I mentioned before while getting that euphonic sound. So I could see many people just owning this and being completely happy. So this is the part where I compare the Bifrost 2 to the Gumby. If you're not interested in that, then fast forward to this time code, wherever the heck I put it, and we'll sum up the pros and cons. Otherwise, stick around because there are some notable differences when you move up in price to the Gungnir or the Gumby. So comparing the Bifrost 2 to it, uh, it, it initially was really hard. They, they sound almost identical on the surface, but the more I listened, I tended to side with the Gumby when it came to instrument separation, to soundstage, and even to details. When a classical song really opened up with many instruments playing, I could hear not only a wider sound stage, but I could pick up on the micro details a bit better on the Gungnir. Um, it's not night or day, but you do hear a difference if you really look for it. But when it came to timbre and dynamics, I simply couldn't tell them apart. And now we have to talk about the bass. The bass and the sub bass, uh, it's noticeably more fleshed out and more pronounced on the Gumby than it is on the Bifrost. The definition and texture of the lower frequencies simply wins out on the Gungnir, which was really surprising to me. It made me want to EQ the Bifrost so I could at least get the bass volume to the level of the Gumby. It really is that, that much of a difference. And there's also a certain level of softness that the Gumby has that the Bifrost 2 does not. Not to say the Bifrost 2 was harsh, it's just the Gumby feels a tad more natural, a tad more organic, uh, with rounder edges, while the Bifrost can feel a hair sharper. So aside from the bass, the differences that I did notice, um, they're not staring at you right in the face, so I really have to applaud Shite for making such a, an inexpensive and quality DAC in the Bifrost 2 here. Uh, and they did that while providing a solid step up in sound with the Gungnir. And like all things high-end audio, there are diminishing returns as you move up the chain in price, and this is a prime example. The Bifrost 2, $700. The Gungnir, $1,300. The Gungnir Multibit is 85% more in price than the Bifrost 2, but you're not going to get 85% more performance. If you want a number, I'd say it's more like 15, maybe 20%. Uh, but if you like the Multibit sound and you have the cash, it's great having something that sounds even more refined than the Bifrost 2. So pros and cons of the Multibit DAX here. 
Uh, the the multi-bit technology in general, I'd say it strikes a great balance between traditional ladder, ladder decks and uh, more common Delta Sigma DACs as well. It could be the be-all, end-all DAC for countless audio geeks. In fact, many people that have found their big budget endgame have decided to go with the uh, Yggdrasil, which is the next level up from the Gumby. Also, Scheidt's Unison USB, clean, it's built from the ground up for audio, it's really just plug and play. All USB interfaces should be just like this. Disadvantages. It was honestly hard to say something bad about this DAC. I felt it does most everything right and it gives justice to the music in a way that's fluid and just really natural. I do have to note that multi-bit DACs didn't quite have the same level of richness that I appreciated from the Ares 2. They also didn't have the same level of detail as the D90. Um, if you prefer either extreme, then these DACs may not be for you. But I have to say, if you give these a listen, it may just change your mind. So on to my personal DAC before this madness began, uh, the RME ADI-2. The RME ADI-2 DAC is a technical wonder. With more Einstellungen and Optionen than jeder andere Verbraucher DAC is er wohl eine Klasse für sich. Der AD2 verfügt über einen internen Kopfhörerverstärker, wird in Deutschland entwickelt und gebaut und ist für 1150 US-Dollar zu haben. So I consider this to be a great reference DAC. It does everything right. Um, with its AK4490 chips, this is the first version, uh, it doesn't sound overly digital and it leans towards the warm and organic side when you're talking Delta Sigma conversion. It has a bevy of options. If you know anything about this DAC, tons of reviewers said it as well. It's just option overload, not in a bad way. It's done really intuitive. Uh, but there's more options than most people would ever need. Uh, and the internal five band parametric, parametric EQ is a huge selling point. As for the features, I touched on these in previous videos, but I find the EQ to be better here with ARMY's specialized hardware versus handled in software via something like PCPO uh, or Rune. Uh, maybe it has something to do with ADI2's excellent analog stage or just the technical know-how that RME brought to this DAC after decades of producing equipment in the pro audio world. Whatever it is, tweaks to the EQ sound cleaner, more pronounced, more refined than the common software options. So as for the sound, uh, when everything is in default mode, loudness, uh, filter, everything that's in default mode. And taking into account all the other DACs here, it sounds, not surprisingly, very similar to the topping D90. So all of the comparative analysis I mentioned before with the D90 applies here as well. So to save time, uh, and instead of repeating myself all over again, let's discuss how the ADI-2 compares to the D90. For pure DAC performance, without any extra features enabled and in default settings on either unit, the topping D90 does sound better than the ADI-2. It is noticeably cleaner, uh, it's noticeably more detailed. The RME, which is already a detailed DAC, cannot match the, D the D90's razor sharp precision or its completely black background uh, when nothing is playing. As I mentioned before, the ADI's sound signature is a tad warmer and more organic sounding. So despite it not having the level of detail that the D90 has, it's still a real joy to listen to. The one aspect where the ADI 2 wins out is soundstage. The D90, for all its clarity, um, it makes things feel front and center like I mentioned before like the musicians are singing directly at you. Whereas the RME here, it sounds like you're sitting in a great orchestra seat or a, of a concert hall. Things feel more 3D, more spacious, more natural. I have a high-res flack of Tank from the Cowboy Bebop soundtrack, which is, you know, their main theme. And the transients are indeed better on the D90. Uh, the instruments have a better sense of realism and lifelike qualities to them. At about one minute and 45 seconds, uh, though there's a little trumpet solo before the band hits again and the more organic presentation of the RME makes this part of the song more enjoyable to me. But then the full band comes in again with a rush with all of its crazy energy and the D90 just handles all of that better with cleaner separation of the instruments. The same theme carried throughout other songs I tested. 
uh, better details from the D90, and a touch more smoothness from the ADI2. Uh, and I have to tell you, the difference is not night and day, like it is coming from the Ares 2 to the D90. Um, but put the RME and the topping next to each other, switch back and forth, then you'll hear the differences. It is enough to make you question, why would you buy the more expensive and less detailed RME? Then you remember it comes with a really good amp, a killer five band parametric EQ, and all of the features you'd ever need from a DAC and more are included. But if you're not really interested in all of the features or the amp, then the Topping D90 takes it for just pure sound quality. In the end, I'd say you get the most value for your money with the RME's ADI2 DAC. There's just so much more available here. And it's not like they, they have asked anything. The features they provide aren't just there to fill a spec sheet. Um, just about every option here just oozes with quality and RME excels at providing the best overall value with this model. So pros and cons of the RME ADI2, DAC, uh, top-notch quality reference class sound like this, um, digital VU meter. Uh, it really is a bonus to see what you're hearing. It helps with imbalance issues and can also reveal which frequencies your headphones may have trouble hitting. The features are well thought out and provide ample sound tuning. Uh, the included amp, which is also of high quality as well, also a pro. As for the cons, the price, if you're just using this as a DAC like I was, uh, it would be great if they could make a version that gets rid of the internal amp. Maybe that would kind of lower the barrier to entry for a lot of people who are on a budget. But one could argue all of the insane features this includes, maybe it's worth the extra cost. Another con, the D90 exists. <laughs> it's a superior DAC when you're talking about raw performance, which I mentioned earlier. An update to the ADI with the latest AK chip should be a monster and would put topping on its toes if it was priced competitively. So let's talk about the Cord Cutest. The Cord Cutest is the company's most affordable standalone DAC for the home. It features a tap length of nearly 50,000 and four user selectable filters to help shape the sound. Lauded by many as the DAC to beat under $2,000. The Cutis retails for $1,700 USD. Cord's products are handmade in its headquarters located in Kent, England. So the most expensive of these so far. And what can you say about Cord? Their products are very expensive. It's no secret. Uh, they're weird. They're just very different from the rest, uh, at least in the sub 2K price range. It may take you multiple Rob Watts interviews on YouTube and several long forum posts before you kind of understand how and why these DACs are different from their Delta Sigma cousins. There are numerous other videos and articles explaining in great detail what taps are, uh, the benefits of an FPGA chip, uh, and Cord's excellent USB implementation. Uh, but ain't nobody got time for that in this huge roundup video, so I'll link some goodies in the comments if you'd like to delve into that further. As for the Qtus itself, we have four filters ranging from neutral to warm, single-ended outputs, uh, BNC inputs if you decide to mate it with a M scaler. Um, there's a micro USB power adapter port and not much else. Like I said, different. For such an, uh, an expensive DAC, it's so refreshingly simple that I actually love the execution. So let's dive into the sound. With the cutest, it initially feels like things are getting softened. At first you feel like you're losing some detail, especially when you compare it to the D90, uh, but you start to no notice that the cutest is kind of just taking the edges and slightly rounding them off. Um, this ends up decreasing the harshness while creating this engaging, sweet sound. It makes the experience feel smooth and intimate versus yelly and in your face. Uh, at times both of these do that. And the intriguing part here that unlike the R2R DACs, the details are actually still very much retained. Uh, where the Ares gives you that smooth and organic sound at the expense of micro details, the multi-bits too to some degree, um, the cutest is able to keep them there, um, just tuning them differently so it's pleasing to hear. Here's a good example, Howling at the Moon by Define Us has some haunting vocals with some big echoey percussion hits 
And when the chorus comes on, we get some deep synthesizer and a quick and precise like hi-hat cymbal just tickling your ears the whole time. Uh, although I really enjoyed how the multi-bit DACs handled this uh, at the beginning of the song, well, when the chorus hits, the cutest just does its thing and handles all the dynamics and all the energy with uh, spectacular elegance, I'll say. It's not overly smooth, but I don't feel my ears getting fatigued like I do from the Bifrost or the Gumby at times when it came to that song. With the D90 and the RME, um, I get the same level of precision, but it feels harsh and more digital comparatively as I turn the volume up. The chord does not feel digital at all to my ears. I don't know how they do it, but they do it. Pizza Guy by Touch Sensitive, uh, a multitude of synthesizers, vocals, percussive elements and instruments, it's all happening at the same time. You get excellent separation, excellent dynamics on the cutest. It's better than the RME and the topping, uh, as well as the R2R DAX. The synthesizers are that much more detailed, not by an extreme overly in your face amount, but just enough where you notice the difference and it really does put a smile on your face when you hear it. Uh, if you have this experience, then you'll start to understand why people love the chord sound. Blowback by Gala Mateus, one of my fun bassy test songs. Uh, it has a nice reverb on the vocals during the chorus, and it comes through noticeably more clear on the cutest than it does on the RME. Both are highly detailed DACs, but the chord is just a level above. There is something about the detail retrieval that is really nice here, while not being overly analytical or sharp. The combination keeps the listening experience very engaging, the rounded off and sweet sounding nature of the cutest is an ever so slight effect, uh, but it's enough where it makes you want to keep listening to how Chord will handle this part of the song, how it's going to handle the next track. Just that level of engagement is really there. Anecdotal experience, I know, but both my buddy Alex and I had the same experience with our respective systems when it came to the level of engagement that uh, the Chord provided. Uh, he loved, I let him borrow the cutest and he loved it so much he turned into a complete chord head and went all in. Uh, he ended up getting a TT2 with an M scaler, and right now he's more than satisfied. And he let me borrow it, which is why I have it in this roundup. So let's get into the pros and cons. As much as I talked about this, I gotta give it some downsides because it's not the perfect DAC. One can argue the cutest greatest strength is also its weakness. That excellent 3D sound stage coupled with a more intimate feeling it creates a somewhat soft sound that sometimes made me miss the detail retrieval of the D90 or, ev or even of the RME, especially for busy songs and uh, high energy parts of uh, tracks. Things like background violins and other supporting instruments had more presence uh, on the cheaper Delta Sigmas in this case. You may be used to hearing certain parts of a song that are much more prominent and the cutest may move that part to the background instead of keeping it at the front or where you're used to. And honestly, you may or may not like uh, the way it handles that. There were numerous times where this happened, but a prime example that I'll use is the song Sky Spills Over by The Punches. Uh, it's a busy song with a fiddle and a banjo backing up the main vocal. Uh, not only is the fiddle more prominent on the D90, but there is noticeably much more texture on the strumming banjo. Um, this is mainly due to both of them feeling closer, uh, thus kind of higher in volume than the cutest. And I was honestly torn here because I thought I liked hearing the stringed instruments in greater detail. It was just due to the D90 putting them front and center, creating more of a flat or 2D soundstage. Uh, the cutest gave more of a wide 3D soundstage, but at the expense of not being as detailed as the D90 in this case. Continuing on with that same song, I have to mention that around two minutes it slows down and this is where I much prefer the cutest um, sweet tone during this part. It, it sounds more intimate, more lifelike, and just less like a recording. So yeah, as nice as the cutest is, sometimes I'd prefer how the D90 uh, or the Bifrost would do certain parts of busy songs. Thomas in Stereo, one of my favorite hi-fi reviewers, he also points out that DACs under the $1,000 price point tend to focus on clarity, while higher end models tend to focus on fluidity. So what you're hearing sounds more natural and less digital. This was most apparent for me in comparing the cutest to the other models here. And many of the reviewers or just 
audio fans, files, whatever you want to call it, uh, they say the cutest is the DAC to beat under the $2,000 price range. And after this review, I'd have to agree with them. If you can hear a difference, like I said before, I listened to Hugo TT2 at Can Jam for several songs, and I thought the chord, I thought the chord was just a complete hype machine. I couldn't hear a difference. Uh, it's not until I had one of these in my quiet home that I understood why people pay so much money for these things. If you can't hear a damn difference, God bless you. Save your money, get the D90, get something else, uh, and you'll be a happy camper. Another thing I'll point out, I do have to uh, say there were times where I simply preferred the RME or the D90, uh, primarily for EDM, electronic um, pop music. It was where I wanted that uh, highly detailed and super sharp pre precision and just liveliness. I wanted those two over smooth and organic and just lifelike sound. The cutest is still no slouch in these genres. You may actually prefer it for those genres, but you also may prefer, like me, the crazy energy that these two provide, the RME and the D90. Uh, they, these just give you that liveliness, uh, that energy, depending on the song. So let's quickly go through the pros and cons. Advantages, best in class sound, uh, very engaging, very different than the rest. It has this great 3D sound stage with incisive transients, very natural transients, which help give it that lifelike presentation. It also has really high quality parts with Chords custom USB implementation, which helps provide that extremely clean sound and dark blacks. Disadvantages, the price, it's high, um, but it's also a custom design chip versus using off the shelf parts. Once you factor that in, it's still high, but the sound quality just backs it up in my experience. Another disadvantage I just mentioned, some may prefer the other Delta Sigma DACs in this review when it comes to high energy, highly detailed music. So that's the skinny on these DACs so far. Stay tuned for part two, where I go through ideal amp pairings with each DAC. I compare them to the Chord Hugo TT2, and I even try the M scaler on all the different DACs in this roundup. I'll give you my final thoughts on which I personally like and recommend, and that is all coming out very soon. We also have some more content headed your way with some much delayed videos that I've already recorded, as well as my new two-channel setup. That's right, Midfi Guy finally has the space to get some two-channel gear, and just like headphones, it's all very addictive. So hit subscribe, and I'll see you in the next one. So long.